Welcome back to Bold TV. I'm your host, Philip Michael. Now, Elon Musk launched another Starship prototype this week, and it blew up again. Now, will we get this space travel thing right anytime soon? Well, here to talk about this exactly is the executive director of Foundation for the Future, Tim Chrisman. Did I say that correctly? You did. You did. <laughs> oh, wicked. <laughs> great. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much for having me. This is I'm, great. I'm glad to have you. Now, how soon could space tourism become a reality? This year. Why do you say that? Uh, I say that because at least uh, one group of regular people like you and I will be headed to space as part of the Inspiration4 mission later this year. And uh, Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit both are uh, talking about their first space tourism launches uh, by end of year. And so while uh, it is going to at first be the sort of uh, rich and famous doing it, for the first time ever, it's not Navy SEAL jet pilot astronauts, and uh, that's pretty exciting. That is exciting. As we say, people you, like you and me is not professionals. It may be different right. people with different uh, uh, money levels, but still regular people nonetheless. But someone listening to our conversation right now might obviously go, okay, the Elon Musk, who people deem to be very advanced, if his spaceships keep blowing up, how do we avoid this first batch of people not being blown to smithereens? What makes you so confident that they're not just going to go up into the orbit and then explode? Uh, because so many are blowing up. We, uh, every single time you do one of these launches and it blows up, this is like uh, Are You the One on MTV where they black out. Uh, you get way more data than if things go pretty close to right. Mm. And so this has been a consistent thing with, uh, I think Elon calls it uh, unexpected disassembly of the uh, SpaceX rockets. The, the actual ones that will be carrying people later this year are the ones that have flown reliably for about 10 years, the Falcon series. They're the ones that delivered uh, astronauts to the International Space Station earlier this year. And the ones about 15 years ago were blowing up um, all the time because Elon has a software developer mentality where he's just like, it's going to have bugs. Let's stress test it and see what happens. Let's stress test. Okay, I understand the logic now. 10 years ago, they were blowing up, and now 10 years later, 10, 15 years later, these are the ones that are operating successfully. So let's try yep. new prototypes that could be even better than the previous, the yep, previous yep. versions, and let's make sure they blow up so 10 years from now, this more advanced one can get us there. Okay, I understand, I understand that logic. Now, we went to the moon in the 1960s. What are we mm -hmm. missing right now that is keeping us from succeeding? Is it merely a matter of, of testing bugs and stress testing? Why is it just now, if we've had astronauts, uh, astronauts for 10 years, is doing it because space is too sexy and weird we think that space isn't real i grew up in alaska a lot of people tell me alaska is like wild and crazy um but at the end of the day the difference between space and here is we don't have the ability to go there reliably live there and come back and there's just not people there so we think it's hard we, and that's the way we are with anything or anywhere new and a little different. But with some time, some essentially railroad building to the sky, as Elon and Jeff Bezos are trying to do, that starts to change pretty fast because people who like new experiences, like tinkering, are going to show up, start duct taping together places to live, and we're going to see a pretty dramatic change in the way we relate to space I'm, up till now it's government only and they don't want to have risk so when it starts to be the private sector that it starts to change fast when you talk about the private sector why do you think vc and the government aren't really backing, backing space right now so government isn't because they feel like they have a tool to do it. They have NASA, it works. Mm. Space Force is the new shiny cool thing, and now we can develop military tools for space. Um, and so there's not an incentive there. Same with uh, Same BC. With BC. Mm -hmm. There's, they have a model that works. Three to five year investments, there you go. quick out, make your money. Right. right. And that doesn't work in a place where, as Elon and Jeff are showing us, you need 10 years of blowing stuff up. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. no profit in blowing stuff up for 10 years. Mm -hmm. 
But all of a sudden, you look at SpaceX and its valuation right now, it is absolutely insane. What is the valuation? It's uh, north of 100, and 100 billion at last uh, valuation. Uh, they're still private. Mm. So um, when they do go public, that uh, changes their, their valuation calculus there. But they're able to deliver consistent returns. They had a loss for a long time. That's the way it is with a lot of these infrastructure type investments. Now, one of the things when we look at uh, disruptions or innovations, if we have, let's say, content delivery, mm -hmm. before that was disseminated through the three pillars of, of, of mainstream media, radio, print, and television, that yeah. became decentralized and evolved into a different kind. Now, you can, in, you can innovate those things. How in the world, or in the space, I should say, do you... Do you innovate the elements? Because we need air, we need water. It, does that exist up there? How you can't just you, you, or can you innovate those things? How do you do? How do you disrupt some the, the elements of of Earth and recreate it elsewhere? How do you do that? Well, so everything we've got here on the ground will be needed in space. Mm, so we're going to bring it there. Whether we're bringing it be ourselves or Starbucks, we're bringing or we're making it there. There's there is not a lot unique about Earth other than how it's put together. Mm. There's asteroids made of ice. There's asteroids made of platinum. One, one astro asteroid near us is worth $20 trillion because of how much cobalt, platinum, and other rare metals it's got on it. So we can collect the raw materials to make just about anything up in space. We're going to need to bring the people and the tools to start actually doing that making. And that's how the disruption happens. That's how when it is the cost of a plane ticket to get to space, that changes the game. Will it ever uh, get there? Will we ever get to the point where it is? Absolutely. Um, what right makes now, you so sure? Uh, so at this point in space travel, we're talking a couple hundred thousand dollars for a ticket to space. Um, we have been doing commercial space flight for one year. This is the first year. And entry-level tickets are several hundred thousand dollars. At this point in air travel, uh, the cost was about $10,000 a ticket for uh, the average plane ride. Mm -hmm. Now, 80 plus years later for plane rides, you know, we have Spirit offering $10 tickets sometimes. Right. So. We've got, we've got a pretty dramatic cost curve that's coming down over the next 10 years, where I expect you could get to space for the price of flying, uh, you know, from DC to Tokyo. It's not gonna be cheap, but it is gonna be, you know, the low 10,000s. Interesting, now what is your foundation doing to push us along in this whole movement, if you will? I was gonna say yeah. endeavor, but it's really a movement. You know, it really is, and we are, championing a very simple cause, and that is space needs to be boring enough to be routine. Because once it's routine, the sort of patient investors and slow building uh, accumulation of both money, talent, and energy can start flowing into space. And we're doing this through a advocacy approach with the Congress where we have a draft congressional bill to create a infrastructure development corporation, basically an investment fund for space that's backed by the US government. We're also developing a blue collar workforce development initiative to make a kindergarten to orbit space pipeline so that the welders, the plumbers, the IT professionals who are going to be needed to fix things, to build things, to make space, have a training pipeline that's real and tangible. And then we're creating a network of people who just want to do it. They're mm. tired of waiting. We've been told for generations, space is coming, five more minutes. We're tired of that. Let's just do it. We'll break it along the way. We'll fix it. We'll try again. And just like Elon showing us, if we can break things fast enough and fix it fast enough, we're going to go far. Speaking of Elon and speaking of 
action. Do you think we'll be on Mars in 2026 like Elon Musk says? I, I am not one to bet against him. <laughs> um, I think he could do it. It's aggressive. Um, and here's the thing. It becomes a lot more doable when we treat this like explorers from the 14, 15, 1600s, where if you're not 100% sure about your ride back, it's very doable to get a human onto Mars. It's mm. the return trip being a 50-50 shot that's what holds up a lot of the planning now. So if you're willing to tolerate that kind of risk, and there's thousands of people who are, Wow, um, that becomes a lot more doable. Um, well, yeah, just food for thought. Back then, with the explorers, they thought the Earth was flat. I guess some people still do, <laughs> and they thought, you know, we're gonna sail, we're gonna fall across, so we stop. They're not sure about the trip back, and that goes back to the point that you're making right here. So, some food for thought for the viewers. We're gonna be space in <laughs> five years. Who knows? Yeah. But time, as always, will tell. Tim, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for watching. And make sure you follow Bold TV on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Have a great day, and I'm out of here.